Hey everybody, welcome to the very last uh, lesson in our series that we've been calling Pure Joy. It's been a study of the book of Philippians. Today is lesson number 13 out of Philippians chapter 4. Hope you've got your Bibles open to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the last, uh, pas uh, last passage out of that chapter. Uh, there is also a listening guide for this lesson. I hope that you will find that listening guide the same place you found this video. Scroll down and click on it. Download it. Uh, print it out. There are some blanks to fill in as we move through the lesson. But even more importantly, there are some discussion questions there for you to talk about with your small group after the lesson. Uh, before we jump into the lesson, let's pray, shall we? It's been so exciting, Lord, uh, allowing your, you and your word through the work of your spirit to teach us about joy, to teach us all of the um, so many different aspects and elements and uh, and, and what's foundational and critical to it and where it can take us and all of the ramifications of this has just been a thrill, Lord, and we are so, so very grateful for this lesson, uh, these lessons and your word. And so, Father, uh, even today, our prayer is that as we open your word yet again, that you will open our hearts, uh, that you will open our minds, that you will lead us to all truth, and more importantly, that you will help us know then how we should live uh, in accordance with these truths. That's our prayer. Change us, Father. Transform us as a result of being here today. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So where have we been through the book of Philippians? We had lessons on so many different aspects of joy. We talked about joy uh, being found in community with others. We've, we talked about uh, the joy that we find um, in a clear sense of mission or a clear sense of calling or purpose in our lives. We, we even talked about how we as Christ followers can find joy in life or death circumstances. Uh, and then we talked about joy uh, that we can find in opposition that we feel from, our, from the world around us. And that was all just in chapter 1. And then we moved into chapter 2 of Philippians and talked about uh, the joy that we find in preserving the unity of the church. Uh, our, our job of preserving the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace and what that means. We, we also talked about the beautiful example that Jesus gives us as a part of preserving unity for being the joy that we find for being humble servants, the joy in humble servitude and, and the, the, the way Jesus showed us a beautiful example of that. We talked about the joy that we find in what the Apostle Paul would describe as the working out of our salvation in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and then we talked about the joy that we find in our interdependence upon one another uh, within the church and within the Christian community. Uh, and then we moved on into chapter 3. Uh, and in chapter 3, we, we talked about how, if we're not careful, religion the trappings of religion, the traditions of religion can actually steal our joy, and we must be careful about that. We talked about uh, the joy that we find in our forward progress, that is, in our continuing to move forward no matter how uh, uh, spiritually mature we have become, there is yet more, uh, more to learn and more to grow, and, and we find joy in that progress. We talked about the joy that we find in our new identities in Christ. Uh, and then we moved from chapter 3 into chapter 4, and last week we, we did a lesson on uh, the joy that we can actually find even in the midst of conflict and, and how we respond to that conflict and how we should be able to rejoice in that. And then this, today's lesson, the very last lesson uh, uh, in this series, uh, comes at a perfect time. Uh, at the time that we're actually initially recording this lesson, uh, it is uh, Thanksgiving week. It is the weekend after Thanksgiving. And uh, so today's lesson is perfectly timed for this because today's lesson is all about finding joy in our thanksgiving, in our spirit of gratitude. Uh, and uh, it's just appropriate. It's appropriate that we, not only that we would finish this whole series with a lesson on gratitude, but that it would come at this particular time uh, in, in our culture's uh, calendar. And so this is, this is just perfect timing. Tim Keller says, it is one thing to be grateful it is another thing to give thanks. Gratitude is what you feel. Thanksgiving is what you do. Uh, I love that. And Paul uh, uh, gives us a beautiful example of actually the doing 
of Thanksgiving, not just the feeling of the gratitude, but the actual giving and expressing thanks. And we're going to see that in, uh, in, in the way Paul finishes this beautiful letter to his beloved church, the Philippian church. He finishes it off with this word of gratitude and this expression of thanks. Uh, just to, to catch you up on it, on what's happening, what, what he's talking about here, uh, apparently uh, the Philippian church has been a supporter of Paul, a financial supporter and prayer supporter of Paul's for some time, but there was apparently a time period in there when that support uh, could not be there just for lack of opportunity. They had no means of getting it to them. Uh, but they finally uh, sent one of their own, Epaphroditus, to Paul, where he is now in prison, to bring a gift, a financial gift to him. And so Epaphroditus has brought that gift to Paul, and Paul is now going to thank them in the very last portion of his letter. We're going to begin uh, in chapter 4, beginning in verse 10 uh, of Philippians, and here's what it sounds like as we read it. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Again, there apparently was a time in there when they, they did not uh, have an opportunity to express their support for him, and now they've found a way to do that, so he's rejoicing in that. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So apparently there had been this time when they just didn't, the, the Philippian church, they, they loved Paul, they, they wanted to support him, they were definitely concerned about him, they prayed for him, but they didn't have a vehicle in place, a means of being able to send their financial support. They have found that vehicle in Epaphroditus now, and so they have done that. Uh, but what's interesting here is that Paul makes it clear that uh, his rejoicing over this is not uh, is, is not in their gift having met a need in him. In other words, he's, his rejoicing, the joy that he's feeling is not about, oh, finally, I've had this problem that they are now addressing or that I've had this need that their financial gift is going to be addressing. What he's rejoicing in is he's rejoicing for them on their behalf because of what God is doing through them. Uh, and then Paul talks about how it's not about my needs uh, because he talks about how he has learned the process of becoming content in every circumstance. And so uh, let's talk about Paul's contentment and, and what he has to say to that. Paul had an interesting relationship with that word, with the word contentment. Uh, because remember, this is the, the, the Paul that is saying to them here, I have learned to be content no matter the circumstances, is the same Paul who said to them just a chapter ago, just at one chapter ago in chapter 3, he said, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He, he, he painted this picture of himself of never sitting still, never being happy, never being, dare I say it, content with where he is spiritually with Christ. He was constantly in forward progress. We had a whole lesson on the joy that Paul found in this forward progress of constantly striving for to know Christ better, to know him better and better. So contentment was not, is not the word that we would use to describe that aspect of Paul's life. But what Paul is content with and has learned to become content with is his external circumstances, whatever those may be, whether he has plenty or whether he doesn't, whether he is uh, filled uh, to his, be his belly is filled after a great Thanksgiving meal or whether he is starving. Uh, either way, he has learned contentment with those external circumstances. And then he says this verse that all of us are familiar with, verse 13. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's just stop and talk about that for just a second. I think that we misuse that verse, and if we're not careful, we see this in all of the, 
all of the Christian-owned gyms. We see this put up in, 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 you know, in the gyms to make us stronger. And, uh, as if we are claiming that we have some kind of physical superpower as a result of Jesus being in us. And I don't think that's what Paul is saying here at all. I don't think he's, he's claiming that there is nothing that my mind wants to do that I cannot accomplish with Jesus living in me. I think what rather what he's saying here is, let's keep this in context, is he's saying in all of these external circumstances, whether they're good or they're bad, whether the whole world is set against me, as long as I've got Jesus, I can make it through it. I can survive. I can move through it. I can do all things. Um, I, it's, it's very much like that young newlywed couple who has not enough money to do anything, but they've got each other. And they would say, look, they would say to each other, we may not have much money. We may not be able to do a whole lot right now, but we've got each other and that's what matters. And, and, and it's that feeling magnified a million times. Paul is saying, it doesn't matter what my external circumstances are because I've got Jesus. As long as I'm with Jesus, I'm gonna be content with whatever the, the external circumstances that this world throws at me may become. So this becomes then Paul's first secret to rejoicing in gratitude. Uh, the first secret to being able to rejoice is being a, be learning this, this process of becoming content, learning to be content in whatever the circumstances. And notice he, he doesn't say, I am just naturally content. What he says is, I have learned to be content. And so the, the idea here is this is a process. It's a process that must be learned. It involves discipline. It involves a prayer life. It involves taking these things to the Lord and getting the Lord's perspective on whatever these external circumstances may be. And through that discipline, through that process, we learn to become content no matter what those circumstances are. And his friendship with the Philippian church was very much a part of that process. And we don't want to miss that. He's, he's talking here to his beloved Philippian church. Those, they're like family to him. They're like children to him. And, and they have been a part of this process of him learning to be content even in really difficult struggles. So if you have your listening guide, let's fill in the first blank on your listening guide and see what our first takeaway is in, in learning uh, to rejoice in thanksgiving. Here's the first, the first statement. Learning to find joy in every circumstance is a process. And it begins with intentional thanksgiving. Intentional thanksgiving. Especially for the people in our lives who know us and love us anyway. And that's who the Philippian church was for Paul. They knew him. They knew him very, very well. They knew all of his character flaws and all of his issues. But they also knew that they had found Christ in him and through him. And so they loved him. They loved him because of that. Uh, and so when we have people in our lives who know us and they love us anyway, then that, that helps us begin this process of being content in all circumstances by expressions of gratitude, by, by doing thanksgiving. Let's keep reading, though, in verse 14. He goes on. He says, Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. You see, what matters most to Paul when it comes to the Philippians is not the gift that they send him. What matters most to him is not the stuff that they give or do for him. But what matters most to him is that they stood with him and have stood with him even in the most difficult seasons of his life, in the most difficult circumstances of his life. They were there to stand with him, even if only in spirit and prayer. Paul had a, a sense of gratitude for the Philippians that ran much, much deeper than just the stuff that they gave him, although that, that wasn't insignificant. He makes that clear. That's not, what, that's not what creates the deepest sense of joy in him and being able to say thank you to them. What creates the deepest sense of joy is the friendship, the, the genuine friendship that he had with them. Um, here's, the thing about, here's the thing about generosity. Giving people stuff. 
often is something that they need us to do. I'm, I'm not diminishing that. But if that's all we set out to do is give people stuff in order to make us feel like we've done something good for them, then we've really missed the opportunity of truly changing lives. Um, uh, there's a book uh, called When Helping Hurts by Steve Corbett and Brian Fickard, and it is a must read for anyone who endeavors to take on Christian ministry, social ministry, and, and, and be in the work of any kind of social justice at all, particularly if it is to poverty, to, to, to try to alleviate poverty in your community. When Helping Hurts is an, an immensely important book. They have some incredible important insights along these lines in that book. And one of the things that, uh, that uh, Brian Fickert says in that book is he says, until we embrace our mutual brokenness, he's talking here in the context of reaching out to try to help poor people, people who are in material need, physical need. Until we embrace our mutual brokenness, our work with low-income people is likely to do more harm than good. In other words, if all we're doing is going and giving them stuff and then leaving them without forging any kind of relationship with them, we may be doing more harm than good. I sometimes unintentionally reduce poor people to objects that I use to fulfill my own need to accomplish something important. I am not okay, and you are not okay, but Jesus can fix us both. And that is the attitude that we must have when it comes to our generosity and helping those in need. Our attitude must be, I am no better off than you are I am broken and I need Jesus in my life and you do too and we will be healed together, you and I. And we create a friendship. We actually forge a relationship that, that makes a difference. And what Paul is saying to the Philippian church here is it's not the stuff that you've given me that has changed me. It is that you have stood with me and been a part of all of my difficult times with me and you've actually forged a friendship that is meaningful to me. When we think about who we're thankful for in our life, it's not so much about the people who gave us stuff. More often than not, it's about the people who stood with us, who, who forged meaningful friendships with us and, and who love us uh, unconditionally. Joy in gratitude is found in those kinds of genuine friendships, and that's what Paul is wanting to say to the Philippian church. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the next blank, the next takeaway, our second takeaway from this lesson. Rejoicing in gratitude for the people in our lives usually has much less to do with the things they have given us and much more to do with the painful times when they have simply stood with us. When they have simply stood with us. But Paul, uh, what Paul is demonstrating here, even in hardship, he is demonstrating this, we talked about this so many times throughout this, the, this study, this remarkable orientation that he has towards others. It's almost never about him. It's almost always about others. It's about them. And even when they're the ones providing to him and giving to him, he turns the focus back to them and he focuses on them. Look, listen to what he says in verse 17. He says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. In other words, when you give this gift, it's not about me, it's about you and Jesus and what inures to your benefit, the blessing that you get out of joining Jesus in this. And it is to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift that you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. But, but what his focus is on is their credit, their growth, their spiritual maturity, their joining with God in doing this work and getting to, to be blessed as a result of that. Once again, his other focus or his orientation towards others is what comes to the surface here and, and, and is what we need to understand about generosity and about this notion of, of gratitude and giving thanks. He is much more interested in what their giving means for them spiritually than he is and what it means to him. He's much more interested in their spiritual growth. Now, this is not to diminish the value of their gift to him. He makes that clear. Oh, this was a fragrant offering, a great sacrifice, and I've been blessed by it. But, but his attention is focused on them and what's happening in them as a result of this generosity. 
All right, is recognizing the spiritual value of their generosity to them, the givers, the ones who are being generous. So this is another secret that Paul shares with us about finding joy in the midst of gratitude is the joy isn't in what we've received. The joy is on behalf of those who have given and what it does in their life. He is rejoicing in their collaborating with God in this work. He's rejoicing in their spiritual growth. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement now on your listening guide. This is the third takeaway from this lesson. Our response to someone's generosity in our lives can be thankfulness for the things they have given us, or it can be a richer, deeper gratitude for their own spiritual growth, for having participated in God's work. Let's aim for the latter. Let's aim for that second one. Um, let's, let's learn to make our rejoicing and our gratitude for, the, for what people have done for us, for people's generosity in our lives. Let's learn to make that rejoicing and that gratitude for what's happening in their life spiritually as a result of their being a part of that. Finishing up then in verse 19 uh, and beyond, here's what he says. And my God, this is a, a very, very common verse, one that you've heard many times before. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then he gives these greetings. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of, our, of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Uh, even those in Caesar's household send greetings to this little church. People that have never met them uh, in Caesar's household sends greeting to them. Why? Because they are a Roman colony, but also more importantly, because they are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the fact that Paul is sending greetings from Christians in Caesar's household means that his influence has spread that far. It is a comment. It is a, it is a remark on, on how much his influence has grown. But he continues in his rejoicing for them. What he does here is he says, uh, not only are you going to grow spiritually as a result of your generosity and participating with God here, but God is going to continue to meet your needs as well. You've probably heard people say you can't outgive God. Uh, no matter how much you, sh you become generous to give to others, God is going to continue to take care of you as well. And, and that's, what Paul, that's, that, that's what Paul is saying to them is don't, don't ever doubt that God is going to continue to care for you and that he's going to continue to meet your needs because that is the economy that God has set up among believers. And Paul is just rejoicing in all of that. The, the joy that he's feeling is in God's economy, this economy that has all of us knowing that we're broken together, knowing that we need each other, forging meaningful friendships and relationships between one another, and then caring for one another's needs. That's the economy, and that is rejoicing in each other's growth as a result of that. So if you have your listening guide, let's fill in the, the fourth blank, the last blank now on your listening guide. Generosity and gratitude. Those are your two blanks. Generosity and gratitude are both critical parts of God's economy for Christ followers. If I'm struggling to find joy today, it probably has something to do with a lack of those two at attitudes in my life. Even, listen, even in the midst of a global pandemic, even in the midst of an economy that has been crushed, even in the midst of all of the division that we feel in our culture today, even in the midst of all of this brokenness, we as Christ followers should be able to find joy because, number one, we've learned or, or are learning to be in content in all circumstances. Secondly, we are, we are learning to be thankful for those who have stood with us even in these hard times. We, number three, we are, we are learning to rejoice in other people's spiritual growth as they stand with us and as they help us. And then lastly, uh, we are having a healthy dose of both generosity and gratitude in our lives. And the more we have of generosity and gratitude, the more we, we lean into those attitudes, the more joy we feel, feel no matter the circumstances no matter what the external circumstances are. 
And that, my friends, is what the Apostle Paul has to say to us about joy in 13 weeks in the book of Philippians. I'm so glad you've joined me in this study. I hope that it's been as much of a blessing to you as it has absolutely been a blessing to me. Uh, we're going to start a whole new unit, a whole new study uh, next week. I hope you'll come back. We're going to be in the book of Mark, and we're going to be studying the gospel of Mark uh, next. And so I hope that you'll come and join me for that. In the meantime, God bless you, and I pray God's richest blessings in your life.